Good morning. I'm honored to be invited to take part in this year's third international conference on the origin of life and universe. I have the privilege of speaking at the first two conferences, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this year's conference as well. Thank you to the Technics and Science Research Foundation for the vision to sponsor and host such an important event. It's exciting to be part of a project in which one of the goals is to show the world how science can be used to build a bridge of friendship between Christians and Muslims. Based on our shared belief in a transcendent creator, we can collaborate to demonstrate to people of all world views how scientific advance points to the existence of God and undermines the evolutionary paradigm, a paradigm often used to justify atheism. As a Christian and as a scientist, I am convinced that nature provides evidence for God's handiwork. As written in the Old Testament book of Job, ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds of the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. And yet, when presented with compelling evidence for design that comes from biology, so many skeptics reject that evidence, and with that rejection, they reject belief in God. They justify their skepticism by pointing out so-called flawed designs in nature, designs that would be unworthy of a creator. As the late evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote in his famous essay, The Panda's Thumb, Odd arrangements and funny solutions are proof of evolution. Paths that a sensible creator would never tread, but that natural processes constrained by history follows per force. And yet in my experience, as we learn more about the so-called odd arrangements and funny solutions, inevitably what we thought were flawed designs turn out to be elegant, sophisticated designs, one that reflects the creator's glory and the latest scientific insights into the human genome beautifully illustrate this point. As a, bio, sorry, as a biochemist and someone who spent most of my life studying biology, I rank the sequencing of the human genome as the most significant scientific accomplishment of all time. The human genome sequence is the genetic blueprint for human beings. From our genetic blueprint, we can gain fundamentally important understanding about the nature of humanity at least in a biological sense. The draft sequence of the human genome was reported in June 2000. There's a famous picture showing then-President Bill Clinton standing next to two gentlemen in bitter scientific rivals, Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, funded in part by NIH in the United States, and Craig Venter, the head of Solera Genomics, a private company that was looking to sequence and commercialize the human genome. The Human Genome Project, funded by NIH, was initiated 15 years earlier, and it cost $3.2 billion to sequence the human genome. Solera was in a race with the Human Genome Project, hoping to complete the sequence before the publicly funded project. If they could, they planned on monetizing the sequence data. As it turns out, Collins and Venter decided to call a truce, agreeing to walk arm in arm across the finish line. In the process, they shared data with one another, facilitating the completion of the draft sequence. During the press conference, President Clinton made these now famous remarks. Today we are gaining, sorry, today we are learning the language in which God created life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. With this profound new knowledge, humankind is on the verge of gaining immense new power to heal. Genome science will have a real impact on all of our lives, and even more on the lives of our children. It will revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. Truly, President Clinton appreciated the significance of having the sequence for the human genome. He even went so far as to describe the human genome sequence as the language God used to create life. 
Yet the initial analysis of the human genome sequence indicated to many scientists that the human genome was anything but the product of a creator's handiwork. Instead of being the language God used to create human life, it appeared to many scientists that the human genome was cobbled together over hundreds of millions of years by evolutionary processes with much of the human genome riddled with molecular fossils, vestiges of an evolutionary history. Many scientists would argue that the human genome stands as the most powerful evidence for human evolution, while at the same time indicating that God had nothing to do whatsoever with humanity's origin. In the next few minutes, I'll explain why these scientists reached these conclusions, but then I'm going to describe some recent insights into the structure and function of the human genome that is radically changing our perspective on the human genetic blueprint in a way that presents the genetic code of humanity as the handiwork of God. Let's begin first by having a little background information on the structure of DNA. This biomolecule consists of chain-like molecules known as polynucleotides. Two polynucleotide chains align in an anti-parallel fashion uh, to form a DNA molecule. The two strands are arranged parallel to one another with the starting point of one strand in the polynucleotide duplex located next to the ending point of the other strand and vice versa. The paired polynucleotide chains resemble a ladder with the side groups extending from the backbone interacting with each other to form rungs. The coupled polynucleotide chains twist around each other forming the well-known DNA double helix. The cell's machinery forms polynucleotide chains by linking together four different subunit molecules called nucleotides. The four nucleotides used to build DNA chains are adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, and thymidine, famously abbreviated A, G, C, and T respectively. The human genome consists of 3.2 billion genetic letters that are distributed among 24 discrete DNA molecules. These molecules interact with proteins to form complexes called chromosomes. These structures become visible in the cell nucleus as the cell divides. Each chromosome consists of a single DNA molecule that wraps around a series of globular protein complexes. These wrapped complexes repeat to form a supramolecular structure that resembles strings on, uh, sorry, a string of beads. Biochemists call the beads nucleosomes. The chain of nucleosomes, no, the chain of nucleosomes further coil to form a structure called a solenoid. The solenoid condenses to form higher order structures that constitute the chromosome. Between cell division events, the chromosome exists in an extended diffuse form that is not detectable. Prior to and during cell division, the chromosome condenses to form its readily recognizable compact structures. All the genetic material in the cell's nucleus is distributed among the chromosomes. The number of chromosomes in each cell is characteristic of a particular species. For example, the nucleus of each cell of a chimpanzee possesses 48 chromosomes, and for humans, uh, the nucleus of every cell possesses 46. The human genome is comprised of 22 autosomes, numbered from 1 to 22 based on size, with chromosome 1 being the longest and chromosome 22 being the shortest. There are also two sex chromosomes, dubbed X and Y, Every cell in the human body has 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set from the mother and one set from the father. The set is made up of 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome, either X or Y. One of the surprises about the human genome came shortly after the rough draft sequence was produced. The initial analysis indicated that only about 20,000 genes are found in the human genome. This was a far cry from the predicted number of at minimally 100,000 genes. This meant that less than 2% of the human genome coded for proteins, the workhorse molecules of the cell. Evolutionary biologists interpreted the rest of the human genome as junk DNA. Evolutionary biologists argue that most of the human genome looks like it was derived from retroviral infections. Also included in the human genome are non-functional genes, dubbed pseudogenes, along with other types of evolutionary debris. At first glance, the human genome looks like a vast wasteland of junk. 
And of course, this begs the question, why would a creator make a human genome with so much useless DNA? In Psalm 8, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, David asks the question, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? David answers his own question by remembering the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 creation accounts for humanity's origin. David replies, You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands. You've put everything under their feet. Given David's words, a human genome littered with garbage is not what one would expect if human beings are the crown of creation. But it's exactly what one would predict if evolution cobbled together the human genome. For evolutionary biologists, a high level of junk DNA in the human genome also provides resolution to something called the C-value paradox, adding presumably to the case for evolution. The C-value paradox traces its origin back to the late 1960s and early 1970s. At that time, biochemists developed techniques to quantify the amount of DNA found in individual cells. They use these techniques to measure the amount of DNA in different cell types comprising an organism. For example, human beings have approximately 210 cell types that make up our bodies. Biochemists were interested in the amount of DNA in each of these cell types. For every organism studied, biochemists found that all the cells in their body contain the same amount of DNA. They dubbed this the C value, where C stands for constant. The C-value refers to the constant amount of DNA found in each of an organism's cells. At that time, biochemists thought that the amount of DNA should correspond to the complexity of the organism. More complex organisms should have more DNA, and less complex organisms should have less DNA. When biochemists plotted C-values for different organisms, they failed to discover any relationship between complexity and the quantity of DNA in an organism's cells. The discovery of junk DNA resolved the C-value paradox. Accordingly, most of an organism's genome consisted of junk DNA, which accumulated through random events. As a result, the C-value varied from an organism to organism with no rhyme or reason. In other words, the size of an organism's genome has no relationship to complexity. It is just the vestiges of an unguided evolutionary history. And again, this begs the question, why would an all-powerful, all-knowing God create genomes with more junk than functional DNA? And even more problematic, why would organisms that naturally group together possess identical or nearly identical junk DNA sequences at corresponding locations in their genomes? On the surface, the explanation that seems to make the most sense is an evolutionary one. Junk DNA sequences arose in the shared evolutionary ancestor and persisted in the genomes as the different evolutionary lineages diverged from, what, from a common ancestor. In other words, junk DNA sequences in our genome and the genomes of other organisms reflect our evolutionary history and can be used to map evolutionary relationships. Yet, over the course of a past decade, Molecular biologists and geneticists have made discoveries that are forcing us to rethink this evolutionary view of the human genome. Bit by bit, re researchers have discovered that most of the classes of junk DNA actually have function. And of course, if junk DNA is functional, it undermines the case for evolution. One could argue that these shared sequences of junk DNA that are actually functional, that occur in corresponding locations in genomes, actually reflect common design, not common descent. The case for design in the human genome virtually became stronger overnight thanks to the ENCODE project. This project was initiated shortly after the human genome was sequenced. It became immediately apparent that simply having the DNA sequence for the human genome was not enough. There had to be some means to interpret the human genome. Nobody knew how to read the 3.2 billion genetic letters. We needed a Rosetta Stone for the human genome. Hence, the ENCODE project was born. Its goal, to identify all the functional elements in the human genome. ENCODE stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. This project began in the early 2000s. The pilot phase cost $55 million to carry out. 
The research consortium attempted to identify all the functional elements in 1% of the human genome. The success with, this, with phase one led to phase two. Phase two cost $130 million and was completed in September of 2012. Phase three is currently underway and the total cost for the ENCODE project will be about $300 million. This is actually a bargain because it cost $3.2 billion to sequence the human genome. So we'll be able to interpret the human genome for a mere tenth of the cost of actually sequencing the human genome. The ENCODE project was big science come to biology. The phase two project consisted of 440 scientists in 32 research groups around the world who performed almost 1,700 experiments, analyzing 147 human cell types, generating 15 times 10 to the 12 bytes of data, and it required 300 years of supercomputer time to analyze the data. The ENCODE consortium produced 40 publications distributed among some of the leading biology journals in the world. Phase three of the ENCODE project will survey the remaining 63 cell types and also look for functional DNA at different points in development and at different points in the cell cycle. This a project will take us a long way towards understanding fundamentally human biology and human uniqueness. It will help us to understand disease processes better. It will help us to develop genetic tools that will allow us to diagnose genetic disorders. The insights coming from the ENCODE project also impact this creation evolution controversy that we've been talking about. These results eliminate the best argument for evolution and eliminate the biggest challenge to biochemical design. So what did ENCODE discover that was so important? Well, these researchers performed six assays uh, measuring transcription, the binding of transcription factors, histone binding, modified histone binding, methylation, and three-dimensional interactions within the genome. All of these processes play a key role in what's called gene expression. It's one thing to know what genes are present in the genome. It's another thing to know how and when those genes are used. We can think of genes in the genome like being words in a dictionary. To write a novel, one needs to use the words in the dictionary in a variety of combinations, often using words more than one time. Each novel uses words from the dictionary in a different way to produce pieces of literature that communicate different meanings. Each, the set of genes found in the human genome are like words in the dictionary. These genes can be used to build cells in the human body with the cells functioning like novels. The genes are used or expressed differently from cell to cell, accounting for each cell type's unique features. Gene expression not only differs from cell to cell, it also changes throughout the course of the cell cycle and during growth and development. Each stage of the cell cycle, each stage of development represents a different novel that needs to be written. And here is the remarkable piece of the ENCODE project. It appears as if most of the DNA sequences found in the human genome are regulating gene expression needed to build and then maintain the human organism. Phase two of the ENCODE project reported that 80% of the human genome displays biochemical activity that likely reflects biochemical function. The ENCODE scientists expect that as phase three is completed, 80% of the functionality will, will turn into 100%. Ed Young, who wrote in an, in an article in Discover Magazine, said this, and what's in the remaining 20%? Possibly not junk either, according to Ewan Bernie. It's likely that 80% will go to 100%, and Bernie serves as the head of the ENCODE project consortium. In other words, the human genome doesn't appear to be a wasteland of junk. It appears to be functional. Most of the DNA sequences in the human genome play a role in making us human beings. This insight stands as a radical revision of our view of the human genome. It's not a wasteland of junk, but an elegant biochemical system that is far more complex than we initially imagined. Well, how have biologists responded to the ENCODE results? Within hours of the publication of the ENCODE results, uh, evolutionary biologists began to decry the ENCODE project citing technical issues with the way the study was designed and the way the results were interpreted. 
These technical complaints continue today, igniting what are called the junk DNA wars between evolutionary biologists and genomic scientists. Evolutionary biologists argue that if the results of the ENCODE project are correct, then cornerstone ideas in the evolutionary theory, such as the C-value paradox, can't be correct. On other hand, genomic scientists see value in the ENCODE results, using them to understand the genetic basis for disease. Evolutionary biologists have roundly criticized ENCODE scientists, claiming them to be incompetent and decrying the design of the ENCODE assays. Evolutionary biologists claim that if ENCODE is correct, then key aspects of the evolutionary paradigm are in deep trouble. But these critics are doing science backwards. Instead of data being used to evaluate a theory, the theory is being used to evaluate the data from the ENCODE project. The character of these objections are not lost on objective members of the scientific community who have suggested that the real motivation for the criticisms of ENCODE are philosophical, even theological in nature. For example, two scientists, molecular biologists, uh, John Maddock and Marcel Dinger, in an article published in the Hugo Journal, wrote these words. There may be also another factor motivating Grar and other related articles, which is suggested by the sources and selection of quotations used at the beginning of the article, as well as the use of the phrase evolution-free gospel in its title. The argument of a largely non-functional genome is invoked by some evolutionary theorists in the debate against the proposition of intelligent design of life on Earth, particularly with respect to the origin of humanity. In essence, the argument posits that the presence of non-protein coding or so-called junk DNA that comprises greater than 90% of the human genome is evidence for the accumulation of evolutionary debris by blind Darwinian evolution and argues against intelligent design, as an intelligent designer would presumably not fill the human genetic instruction set with meaningless information. This argument is threatened in the face of growing functional indices of non-coding regions of the genome, with the latter reciprocally used in support of the notion of intelligent design and the challenge to the conception that natural selection accounts for the existence and complexity of organisms. John Maddock and Marcel Dinger, who wrote these words, are not creationists. They're not intelligent design proponents. Our design of the human genome is in its infancy. Forced by their commitment to the evolutionary paradigm, many biologists see genomes as cobbled together product of evolutionary history. But the more that we learn about the structure and the function of genomes, the more elegant and sophisticated they appear to be, and the more reasons to think that the genomes are the handiwork of our creator. I would like to conclude with the words of Eric Green, the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. During the early debates about the Human Genome Project, researchers had predicted that only a few percent of the human genome sequence encoded proteins, the workhorses of the cell, and the rest was junk. We now know that this conclusion was wrong. ENCODE has revealed that most of the human genome is involved in the complex molecular choreography required for converting genetic information into living cells and tissues. In light of the data coming from the ENCODE project, as a Christian, I feel justified in viewing the human genome and hence human beings as a product of a creator's handiwork. In Psalm 139, David sings a song of praise to the creator, summarizing the latest insights from the ENCODE project well when he declares, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. Thank you.